Fantastic. So let's jump right in. Um, first question goes to John. So John, why does HR have to transformation transform? Excuse me. Anyway. Well, at this point, I think there's any number of indications uh, that there's an impatience with HR uh, to move ahead and to address the challenges. About five years ago, a number of my chief HR officer friends and other thought leaders began coming to me, Ian, and Ian Ziskin and others, and the curve they drew was kind of a straight line going up that said, this is HR's progress. And that line kind of kept up with the challenges up to about the 80s and 90s. And then virtually all of them drew a opportunities and challenges line that began to exponentially increase. So uh, I've written a little bit about this, uh, call, calling it a tipping point, where if HR doesn't shift its line of progress, it's actually going to be pretty far behind the challenges and opportunities. You see leaders that routinely say their workforce isn't ready for the future, routinely say that they can't get uh, change happening quickly enough, that skills are changing faster than they can um, can address them. Uh, and then in this team, in the, in the CREATE group was what it was called, they talked about uh, work becoming more democratic and technology moving exponentially were the two dimensions they looked at. So again, as I said, almost all the data suggests that HR is very well regarded, but also that there's a pretty significant impatience to see the profession move ahead and address what I would call this tipping point. Fantastic. Um, additional comments. would love to hear a little bit more about what examples or instances you have, anyone has of HR being behind, um, and also a little bit more on the uh, topic of things becoming more democratic. So maybe, I'll, if I may, I'll just sure. expand a little bit on that. Thank you very much. I, and, and then I'll, I want to give time to the, to the real talent on the panel here. <laughs> um, so may, perhaps I'll talk about those two dimensions a bit. Um, one of them, this idea of, of work being more democratic, has to do with uh, something I, I think Dave will probably talk about in his writing about shifting organization forms. The idea that the organization that counts is becoming more the social organization, perhaps rather than the formal organization, that those boundaries that we call something like our company or our organization are increasingly permeable. Uh, and in, in some cases almost meaningless because the work is coming from anywhere to anywhere and the workers that you engage may, may or may not be people that you call employees with an employment contract. In addition, this idea of democracy is because people in or people workers uh, in organizations or outside have a much greater voice. It takes one blog for someone to go viral, and then you've got one worker in your organization representing the viewpoints of everyone. Just for example, uh, the idea of the of a worker collective is hardly contained anymore in the notion of of a union or a company collective, but rather represents a social network. Uh, and then technological empowerment. That one, I think, Anna will talk very nicely about. Uh, in, in terms of HR, technological empowerment means the idea of using things like AI and chatbots and creating a kind of whatever, use your, whatever metaphor you like, an Amazon-like, Netflix-like, Google-like experience at work in the same way that people have that experience as consumers. But a technological empowerment is also driving a significant amount of, of the impatience, I think, that leaders mm -hmm. have. Uh, and their willingness to go, to, I think, to other functions. So they'll start a technology project with their IT group, with their operations group, et cetera, to over-characterize a little bit, often overlooking the human capital issues until it's too late, even though they all recognize that those human capital issues are likely to be the pivotal one. And I think they're looking around for a function that can help them handle that. Mm -hmm. So Anna, Anna and John, uh, sorry, Anna and Dave, any comments about this tipping point and the impatience you're seeing as well that's um, uh, catalyzing a need for HR to transform? You know, I, I will just say a couple of words. First of all, I, was, I participated in this initiative, uh, Create HR, which was absolutely exciting and innovative. And I think, um, in, without commenting on uh, data and technology, which I want to expand on a little later, I would like to say that exactly those forms of innovation that is bringing new energy to HR. It, it look at this forum that we have now, globally connecting, crowdsourcing ideas, exchanging. That wasn't the case before, and technology is enabling it. But I do think what's drastically changing now is HR is stepping into the innovation shoes. 
that wasn't the case before. We, um, you know, what, what gives me a lot of optimism and hope uh, for the function is that HR is becoming and claiming the innovation sort of space and place in organizations. And, and that's um, the opposite of the caution, compliance, and other, you know, behaviors associated with what HR was. So we are leaving technology behind as a platform to, cat, uh, to be the catalyst for these types of forums. I do believe that um, taking on the innovation uh, role is absolutely critical for that transformation that John is talking about. Awesome. Thank you. Dave? Um, I tend to be a little uh, both skeptical and optimistic about HR. Uh, John expresses skepticism. I express a little bit of optimism. Uh, I think our aspirations should always exceed our resources. And I think the aspirations for HR, not to be transformed, but to create value, has been around for quite a while. How does HR create value? Uh, we've been lucky enough. Uh, there are two longitudinal studies in HR that I think complement each other. One is by John and Ed Lawler, two of the brightest folks in the history of this field. And then we've done some work, and we've looked at HR competencies since 1987 uh, with seven waves of data. And so we have 90,000 respondents, somewhat like John's data. We have seen, for example, the HR knowledge of business has gone from three point, and I won't get this exact, 3.17 to 4.23. So anyone who's done research on a 360 and you get a one point increase on a five point scale, that's spectacular. So I'm kind of an optimist that HR, our aspirations still exceed our resources. Uh, which is a great opportunity gap, not a criticism, but an opportunity gap. But the HR field is a field I think has made enormous progress. And our data, our data shows that in every competence domain, business, HR, change, uh, managing culture, the skills of HR people have gone up dramatically. If, can I respond really quickly to uh, our data? Yeah. Um, you know, I think I totally agree with you and, um, and uh, love um, the data that's um, kind of giving us the temperature on where HI is. Um, but I always ask myself a question, to what extent the state of HR as it was and is changing now as it was, was the function of the design of the organizations, the goals of the business, the priorities that the business set up, which left HR and what HR does sort of in the sidelines. So I do think that part of it is, you know, beating HR up and saying, yes, HR didn't um, live up to the expectations. Of, at the same time, I do think that there are some um, design constraints and in what we were able to do and what was expected. And as you know, you set the purpose and you get the outcome. Um, certain people who were attracted to the profession the practices that were set in place. So I want to kind of take that approach. And, and what I'm seeing now, where the opportunity comes, is really stretching those boundaries and rethinking of what the business is in the business of doing. So just jumping in for um, to. No, it seems, it seems you all share a bit of uh, po uh, positivity and cynicism about uh, a, healthy, a healthy balance of optimism and cynicism about how to pave the way forward. And, and that's probably what propels you to study this space further and, and be with us to uh, rattle some cages here today, hopefully. Um, so, so we'd love to dive in now into one of the topics you all mentioned, um, which is the role of technology and data. And um, Anna, I uh, would love for you to share with us a little bit about how you see the role of technology and data in HR specifically. Um, again, being the optimist um, in, um, um, in the field, I, I do think that finally HR has uh, found its engine. Um, the um, analytics and technology, digital technologies especially that's coming to us, is going to create a, a whole a range of opportunities that were not available to HR before. Um, uh, one of the constraints that I feel that HR has experienced uh, was pre from about the 70s, you know, the, the business was primarily focused on 
um, on um, uh, profit maximization, the whole Milton School, of, Chicago School of Economics, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and only a couple of days ago, if not a couple of weeks ago, uh, the business roundtable of top 200 executives came out with a reframing of the pur purpose of the corporation that actually uh, stated that it's the entire stakeholder um, community that uh, drives the business. And what always energized me in HR was Peter Drucker, really, uh, the founder of you know, management science and who provided a lot of insights into um, what HR needs to be doing or what business needs to be doing. And, and his, his point was it's the customer that makes the business. So I think, I think with this redirection somewhat of HR being mostly finance constrained is the way I see it with the um, uh, available tools um, that allow us to measure what was in, intangible before and not visible to um, the un, um, um, you know, untrained eye. Um, and now we have a way to, um, to uh, quantify, to uh, present the data or evidence in the broader sense of the word of what HR has been trying to um, talk about before. And if you think about what um, analytics and technology is doing now, it really is providing information about the sides of the, of the, the part of the organization that was sort of an, off the radar for, for a long time. And that's how I see the opportunities that um, data and, uh, and analytics um, and, uh, and digital technology is bringing to HR. It's really a totally new set of tools that allow us to, with evidence, um, redesign, reframe, and most importantly, tell a very different story to the business. And obviously, the question comes up about the skill sets required uh, from HR and whether HR is going to be the traditional HR, the legacy HR is going to be able to stand um, as, as, um, to um, uh, live up to the expectations. And I think it's just a question of time. As you know, there's a lot of conversation. And most recently, just a couple of days ago, Diane Gerson was on all of the major uh, new, uh, news networks. Um, Diane is the head of HR for IBM, and she's the leading voice in um, the whole conversation about skills and training, et cetera. And when I, just as an example, when I designed our master's degree at NYU in people analytics and technology, we specifically worked with Diane on thinking about, so what this whole trend means to HR and develop um, a kind of a, a blended professional approach with um, a whole, you know, a whole range of analytics topics, but at the same time, um, at the same time, a professional domain, HR domain expertise, as well as business acumen, et cetera. So in my view, we are really at the, not only at the next step of HR evolution, but a, a significant pivot on uh, what John Boudreau calls tectonic shift to um, a function that's going to be more um, enabled and uh, empowered to do what it's uh, best um, set up to do. So follow-up, thank you, Anna. Follow-up would be, um, and I'd love to uh, check in with you first on this follow-up question. Um, what, what are some of those uh, stories you can share? Is there a story you can share about um, how the, you know, the, the increased capability of technology making more of what you used to talk about now visible and quantifiable? Um, can you walk us through an example of that? And uh, same question for, for John and Dave, if you have any stories. You know, the most, exciting, the most exciting part of, um, uh, of um, uh, this uh, technology revolution that I call is definitely organizational network analysis. Before, and Dave spoke about it and John wrote about it a lot, you know, we, we were focused on individual. We knew a lot about individual. We measured, we, um, you know, uh, calculated, we presented, you know, uh, profiles. Um, IO psychology spent a lot of time, you know, uh, fine tuning the tools. Uh, but what we were not able to do, and that started with Rob Cross, and now is just really hugely expanding, is organizational network analysis, relation, relational analytics, 
that are allowing us to see what's actually happening in between, how collaboration, how productivity is, is, um, is created. And, and I think it's giving us tremendous power in understanding how groups of people operate. And just one more point, because I'm very excited about it. I just had Brian Valley from Google, um, that is a fairly mature people analytics function, talk to us. And when we asked him who they're recruiting, um, he didn't really talk about data scientists or uh, you know, um, other types of technical skills. He was very excited about hiring a social anthropologist. He said, finally, we were able to hire a social anthropologist on our team and we're very excited about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Same question. Any examples where you're seeing the visibility of, of data and quantifiable ability of data uh, in HR having an impact, Dave or John? John, go ahead. I can't believe you're not moving. You look so <laughs> stoic. Maybe that's just the camera. The, but, uh, the, trick, the trick is to uh, stand up, Dave. I mean, I've got a, <laughs> I, I need to bring you to my office in New Mexico sometime. In a tiny little space with a tripod, you can create the effect of calmness, which Dave knows is all an illusion in my case. Um, <laughs> so thank you, my friend. Um, so, and I guess that was kind of giving me a little opportunity to go, and then I want to, I want to allow Dave in. Uh, let me, I'm going to put in one quick plug, and Dave, thank you so much for uh, so honoring Ed and my work in conjunction with yours, and, and I would agree that those two surveys complement each other beautifully. The survey that Ed and I do is currently available and in the field, so a very quick plug. Um, please write to me or go to the Center for Effective Organizations and uh, volunteer to get a link to that survey. We'd love to get uh, as many responses as possible. Um, and so uh, to, to the question here, I think, I think Anna makes a great case. The potential for analytics is huge. Uh, and, and, and I think unlike Dave, one of the things we've seen in our survey that in a way is kind of perplexes that in me is that we see um, much less movement than we might have expected over the 20 or 25 years we've been doing it. Um, and I think the reconciliation here is that there is a, there's a group of people like the Diane Gersons of the world, uh, Scott Petaskey at Amazon, any number of people that Lucien Alzieri at Prudential, any number of people that we could mention. And to me, that represents the part of the iceberg that's visible above the water. Then there's the part of the iceberg that is far bigger and is visible below the water, where I think we have the bulk of HR work going on, perhaps in smaller organizations or different regions or something like that. And I think it's, in, first of all, important to think about that entire iceberg. And I think one of the reasons that Ed and I see relatively smaller movement, perhaps, in, in things outcomes like whether HR is, is uh, providing decision support, the degree to which HR is telling stories with data, uh, is kind of the one is a disconnect between what's happening in the function and how that's translated into value. And I know Dave will talk about that. The other one is, I think, where HR is happening. And I think it's extremely important that we think about how these things trickle down and that they don't remain um, that they don't remain just at the tip of the iceberg. Um, so, so yes, there are plenty, you know, I think it's terrific. There are lots of examples. We can predict uh, manager and employee attrition better than we ever have. We can anticipate how recruitment markets are changing better than we ever have. There's deep, deep real-time data about people's engagement, about people's attitudes, et cetera. But there's the opportunity that I, I think of Laszlo Bach and his new company pursuing the opportunity to nudge leaders and employees when it's time to uh, have a conversation about performance or development. We live in a world where it's quite likely that leaders very soon are going to get minute, you know, day by day, if not minute by, by minute nudges saying uh, you've got a workforce that's starting to look like it needs this or that. Um, I love that potential future. To be honest, I think it's going to blur the boundary between HR and leadership. I think all of those technologies allow us to think about a world where the knowledge is imparted to the people who use it, very often outside the HR function. And that suggests, I think, a very different role for HR, really measured much more by the quality of thinking and the quality of actions of the workers and leaders in the organization, with HR as a function kind of fading into the background in terms of the people who do this stuff, and instead being the people that provide the stories, the decision support, et cetera, that almost seamlessly make leaders and workers better at this stuff. Yeah. I love to, uh, the way you frame it in terms of the iceberg, 
of what's asked for and also what uh, those unstated needs and providing decision support like uh, like we never have. Fantastic. All right, so with that, we'd love to move on to the next uh, question, if that's okay with all of you. Um, so Dave, this goes to you. Uh, we talked about a little bit about what's emerging. We, we talked already about what's, what's happening, a little bit about the past, a little bit about the present. And we'd we'll love your take on, on what's emerging for the future of HR as a start. And then we'll again open it up to Anna and John for more comment. Um, let me start with a question. So if you're listening, uh, because I am always passionate about what's next. I mean, that's uh, the passion I think we've had forever. What's the most important thing HR can give an employee? It's a very simple question. I've asked it of HR people recently. I've asked it of business leaders. What's the most important thing HR can give an employee? And I hear things like experience, uh, opportunity, vision, values, purpose, uh, the 180 leaders of the business roundtable, uh, profit and purpose. I think, by the way, they've got it wrong. I think it's profit through purpose. I don't think those are separate issues. I think they're connected. And, um, but what's the most important thing that HR can give an employee? Our answer is very clear, and I think it's the next generation HR. The most important thing HR can give an employee is an organization that wins in the marketplace. If we don't win in the marketplace, opportunities, visions, purpose, values, compensation doesn't happen. And so our view is that where HR is headed in great firms, and I like John's comment, I would argue 20-60-20. 20% of HR people at every level are exceptional and you've just listed some. 20% of HR people are frankly not and may not get there. Um, and if you wanna find them, I probably uh, help them get to that bottom 20%. I like to work with the 60% in the middle. Um, and the question I like to help them with, what does HR do to help you win in the marketplace? It's not about the HR activity, it's not about the employee experience, it's about will the employee experience lead to outcomes with customers, with investors, with communities? Number two, what is it we uniquely bring to the table? Our first discussion for 15 minutes reminded me a little bit of, oh, HR should get to the table. My experience, at least in those top 20, obviously HR has been at the table for decades. In the bottom 20%, they're never gonna get there. I hope in the 60%, they're now at the table. So what do they bring that helps an organization win in the marketplace? We've discovered three things, talent, competence, commitment, contribution of people, talent matters. And I think for the last 25, 30, 40 years, HR's focus has been around the workforce, the people, the competencies of people. We also think HR brings organization. Uh, network analysis is one example of that, but what are the capabilities of an organization? Anna mentioned network analysis, she mentioned uh, uh, innovation, you could talk about collaboration, customer service, agility, uh, John talks a lot about information, which I think is a critical piece. And in fact, in our research, we did a study with 1,200 businesses. Look at the competence of the people. These are the fingers of people. And look at the organization as a system. What matters more for business results? Not what matters more for HR. What we found was 80-20 systems. Our sense today is that HR is moving rapidly away from just the workforce to the workplace, from competencies of people, the capabilities of work organizations. So I'll stop, I've gone too long already. Two agendas for HR, one, it's not what we do. HR is not about HR. HR is about delivering business value outside the company. So when I read HR reports, I love to say, have you mentioned the customer? Have you mentioned the investor? Have you mentioned the community? Number two, it's not just about people. It's not just about talent, it's not the workforce, it's the workplace, it's the capabilities that customers will value. Quick example, uh, culture. Culture is generally defined as the roots of the tree. These are the roots, I would argue the roots are the anchors. I'd like to define culture from the outside in. Culture is the leaves of the tree, it's the branches, it's the aspirations. Culture is defined through the eyes of the customer. And HR's job in creating that organizational capability is to build the right culture, not just to build the values, but to build the values that create value. Okay, I've rambled. That's some of our aspiration of where we're headed.
Dave, I agree. Uh, Francesca, you're on mute. Okay. All right. So, yeah, I just wanted to jump in, Dave. Uh, and, you know, I loved your podcast with David Green, and it allowed me to reflect on what you're saying a little bit ahead of time. And um, what I would say, totally agree on the customer. I would like to have an offline conversation with you about investors. Um, oh, let me talk. I'm going to interrupt. Yes. Because when we look at investors, what they want is market value. I mean, that's not complicated. Right, right, right. What we have found in John's research, by the way, I should tell the world, John introduced me to email. John, you probably don't remember, but it was decades ago in my home in Ann Arbor. And you said you were visiting from Cornell. We were so privileged to have you teach with us. You said, Dave, there's, there's new technology called email. And I said, oh, I don't think that's going to take off. And John introduced me to a technology. And he continues to introduce me to new stuff. So, um, Anna, one of the things we've learned, and it's documented everywhere, is that intangibles create more market value than tangible assets. So it's not the asset, it's the market perceived value of the asset. When we look at intangibles, we often look at brand, uh, we look at opportunity, we look at vision. Underneath that, I think, are the HR issues. In our work on leadership capital, we've created an index that says, there's a Moody's index that measures your financial performance, but finance always looks backward. It's a, it's a scorecard of the past. HR is creating a scorecard for the future. And we can show that HR issues, leadership, culture, have a dominant impact on the market value of an asset. And so we think the new ROI of HR is return on intangibles. It's not return on cash flow. It's can I demonstrate to the investor the intangibles? If you want a case study right now, it was written up in HR executive this month, McDonald's. And you'd go, you got to be kidding me, a quick service restaurant. But their CEO and head of HR have recognized that the key to their long-term viability is not just cash flow and product, but creating confidence in the investment community. And their market value is up about $40 billion because the HR group, partly because the HR group, they can't take all the credit, has begun to identify how investors can have confidence in their leadership, their culture, their agility, and to your words, their innovation. So I think the HR return on intangibles is an incredible opportunity for us. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I get passionate. Totally, no, totally agree with you, Dave. And I remember your article about that. So I, I think that you need to qualify that when you speak to a broader audience because um, it could be a little confusing especially in the context of what most recently the discussions that are happening around, um, you know, again, profit maximization. So I think you have a much broader view, much more comprehensive view of what, of Thank what, you. what it is. Thank you. Good counsel. Thank you. Maybe you could teach me the next internet device so, uh, <laughs> so I can get on beyond uh, email. <laughs> I think you've probably got 3,000 people on this call who are happy to, uh, to help. Okay, John, um, what are you thinking as you reflect on Dave's comments and uh, the emergence of what's ahead for the future of HR? Any thoughts so, you like uh, so, so the idea of, of intangibles, which is what finance calls all the stuff that they can't measure, uh, kind of what's left over after they measure everything. It's not meant as a criticism, but it is kind of the financial definition. And I think Dave and Anna both, and maybe all of us understand that and, and have for probably 40 years, that those intangibles, things measured at the, and I think Dave makes a good point about the measurement unit of analysis. So there are intangibles embedded in the individuals in the workforce. I think increasingly it's possible to measure and, uh, and then to, uh, to, to give leaders and workers a chance to improve things like the team, which works very differently than the individuals, the social network, which works very differently than just the individuals who are in it. And ultimately, as Dave said, the organization, the leadership, et cetera. I will say I'm somewhat skeptical. I, I, it's, uh, I rarely meet uh, an investor who has a good understanding about what they mean by leadership or culture or something like that. Culture is probably one of the most uh, used and yet misunderstood concepts that we have in the world of social sciences. That's not to say it isn't real, but it is to say that we have a lot of work to have some kind of a common understanding. I like Dave's idea about looking from the outside in. I, th I think it's important for us to, uh, to help investors and others understand those intangible concepts and help them understand that their definition is often pretty vague. 
and that markets move very often on things that aren't particularly well defined. Uh, I think it, HR has a real opportunity there. Anna mentioned the idea of data and evidence. Uh, let's take the idea of culture. My guess would be that investors, if we ask them what they mean by culture, would be all over the map. That's not to say they don't invest on it. It is to say I don't think they understand it very well. There are decades of research about culture that we could draw on. Uh, and I, I guess I would put in a plug here to, or a, a, a caution here to say that one of the things that, that needs a great deal of attention is how we move what we know in the research that, that should be affecting HR out into the, the mindset and the, and the awareness of people like employees, investors, et cetera. And then finally, I would say, I think I would just reiterate, for me, the measure of HR is, is often going to be that it's in the background. Uh, and, and if someone asks me, and when I work with organizations, how, how will you measure whether HR is doing its job? I tell them, you know, then in that case, let me talk with your leaders, and let me talk with your employees, and let me look at the quality of the answers they give to what is culture and how does it affect your outcomes? What, what, is, what is the workforce and what is its quality? I must say, I still find that those answers are pretty simplistic, that they often contain assumptions that are simple and often pretty dangerous. Uh, assumptions like, you know, we need a great workforce everywhere, we need a common culture, things that we know are just not true, but seem to be in the minds of investors and others. So again, I, for me, the opportunity for HR is that in five or 10 years, we're gonna look and we're gonna say, Finally, we have investors, leaders, workers, and others that are thinking better about these issues and they're more, more clear in their definitions and more clear in understanding how they create the value that they've talked about. Thank you so much. This actually uh, connects quite well to a question um, I see here from the audience. And I, I'd love to start with, um, start with you, John, which because you touched on when you speak with leaders. Uh, the question is, when you are, you seem to be uh, kind of steeped into organizations. So when you are um, having these conversations with leaders and what, what is it that they are quite moved by um, when they're seeing, so what kind of HR innovation does it seem like they're quite moved by in your experience so far? You know, I think um, for, it's an interesting paradox. I think the, lead, the leaders that I work with and I think the CREATE group who have access, much closer access to lots of the great leaders in the world, I think what they found was a leadership group that is very predisposed to respect and to believe that there is value in HR. Um, Pete Ramstead and I defined the value function as being, you know, maybe of three components. One is kind of efficiency and compliance. Another one is delivering great services or great products when leaders or others ask for them. And then a third one was this idea of decision support and the idea of helping to define in the minds of leaders and others how they think about uh, these issues and how they think better. Now, so I think that I think that leaders generally respect and find their HR function and their HR leaders uh, to be valuable, uh, to be helping them, and to be adding value. I think what we need to work on is, as Dave said, aspirationally helping them understand the difference in value that HR could provide. For example, I think leaders will often say, I love HR, it's doing great, and that's because they provide counsel to me. Uh, they provide somebody I can talk to. When I ask them to do a great program, they initiate that program, whether it's analytics, et cetera. I think that, that's great but it's really oriented right around what Pete and I call the effectiveness part of the value function. Um, I think leaders are less inclined to say, I'm looking to HR to get me thinking differently. Um, just something that's very edgy, we've seen a lot of articles lately that suggest that on issues like the Me Too movement or other issues of diversity and inclusion, it's possible that HR has defined its value in preventing lawsuits rather than in creating an organization that, that creates value and purpose out of the edgy dilemmas that exist there. And, and so I think you see leaders saying, HR is doing a great job, and to over-characterize greatly, they may be measuring it by something like, like we're avoiding lawsuits. Indeed, the real value might be that HR needs to get them to think about how we embrace these differences uh, and, and uh, get beyond perhaps just thinking about them as risks. Fantastic. Same question to you, Anna. What are you finding uh, leaders are moved by? Okay. Um, you know, we've heard a lot about the surveys that are done to, you know, the entire kind of the, the, the thousands of HR professionals out there. What I did in the CREATE team, if John, if you remember, we were actually went to the boardroom 
-hmm. And uh, we wrote an article and did some research on uh, what's the boardroom thinking about in terms of um, HR um, input as well as some of HR responsibilities that are being elevated to the discussion of the um, of the corporate boards. And what we found, again, um, that there is a shift that's occurring uh, from, you know, uh, HR being primarily invited on the compensation conversations, et cetera, again, working with external uh, consultants to the questions of uh, talent and diversity coming in more into the center of discussion. And I think when we are looking at various measurements of HR effectiveness, we shouldn't forget that, you know, what gets elevated to the board discussion is really um, another uh, indicator of how HR is making progress. But I would agree with, with John, there is a lot of um, need to scale, um, you know, the competence that we do have in the profession at the top of the iceberg. Um, and this is where I'm a very optimistic about uh, the technology that's coming in because what, um, what uh, it, it's not, uh, the platforms, the um, collaboration tools that are coming in do not have value by themselves, but they are shifting behavior. And what they are lo uh, allowing us to do, they allow us to accelerate innovation. If before Dave and John would be speaking to an audience of a handful of executives who paid their, you know, membership into their groups, now they're speaking to thousands of people who can dial in, um, uh, and and I think that that's that's going to significantly accelerate that competence. If we don't want to call it the skills acquisition as well as the confidence. And uh, the change in the mindset, not only of HR, but those managers who are dialing into this conversation as well. Um, I have another question. I think it relates to a bit of what you were speaking of, Dave, about preparing the next generation. Um, as a, and actually, all of you have spoken about that. Um, and the question is, have you seen any changes with the way HR is needing to collaborate and work with other functions, other disciplines? I'm going to go back to the comment before and then, and then respond oh, sure. to that. Um, okay. One of the things, and I love questions, I love to go to senior HR people and ask the question, what's the biggest business challenge you face today? Very innocuous question. It's almost a Rorschach test for HR. Just did that with a whole bunch of newly minted CHROs, and here was their answer. What's the biggest business challenge? Succession planning, changing the culture, managing talent, hiring people, paying people. Almost every answer was within the HR domain. The unconscious bias of many of us in HR is that HR is about HR. My answer to the business leader is, I don't need the business leader to come to my side of the railroad. I need to go to her side. What's the issue you're wrestling with as a business leader? Is it global markets? Is it innovation? Is it speed to market? Is it reduced cycle time? And my job in HR, and I totally agree with John, is to be a silent partner at providing insights around talent, organization, and leadership. Those are our three that will enable a business leader to reach their goals. Now, to your question specifically, how do we do that? We partner with marketing, finance, IT, supply chain. As a collective group, we provide insight that allows the business leader to do what John calls decision science, which is a great place to go to be able to make that happen. Final caveat, we've talked a lot about information and technology. My view is that in a simplistic way, all technology is, is an enabler of information. That's it. Technology enables us to get information. And the other side that's fascinating, and this comes from my colleague Wayne Brockbank and Hayek and some other information theorists, 20% of the world's information is in spreadsheets where you can do statistics, you can do analysis. 80% of the world's information is called unstructured. It's qualitative research. It's what you observe, what you see, what you feel. I get a little worried that the HR analytics field is so focused on that 20% of what's in spreadsheets that we can do statistics. And I love statistics. My PhD is in numerical taxonomy. I love statistics. That we miss the 80%. There is something to be said at not losing value of... And Anna mentioned it, I can't remember exactly, that I think it's Google is hiring social anthropologists who have a sense of that 80%. Sometimes I think we're in HR, we're so afraid that we're not empirical 
that we let go. There is knowledge, there is value in that 80% of unstructured data. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, same question actually, Anna, about have you seen a change and what would you advise on um, how HR needs to partner and collaborate differently going forward with other functions? Again, with the, in the spirit of what I, you know, position myself as doing is trying to distance ourselves from the structural constraints that HR had uh, before. I think HR used to be, and still in many cases, continues to be over-reliant on finance. Um, in, in some organizations, HR used to report to finance. And, 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 and that, I think that really stymied and slowed HR evolution into or coming into its own and so what's encouraging to me is first of all to see partnerships with uh, with IT to partnerships with technology because of the digitization and because of the role that I, um, technology is playing in organization I'm seeing a lot of knowledge transfer in very different relationship that HR has developed with with IT organization and um, agile agile principles etc is one of the examples where HR is learning a lot from software engineering etc and then obviously customer uh, customer service I uh, see some of the HR roles and that's probably unique at this point but if you take uh, Adobe and Donna Morris, one of those, again, unicorns in HR, but really setting the stage for blending customer relations and employee relations um, uh, areas. So she's the head of a, a, he's a, a head of employee experience and a head of customer experience at the same time, having come to this role from HR. Um, so I think that HR aligning itself, and, and that really, I think, is also um, consistent with what David was saying, aligning itself with more of a customer-facing, market-facing, um, you know, marketing plays a role, of course, in branding and employee um, uh, value proposition, and et cetera. So, again, uh, moving and developing a, an ecosystem of relationships that is much broader than just, um, you know, compliance and uh, finance as we used to be just a few years ago. Um, that's where I see the opportunity. Fantastic. So we've got about a minute now to wrap. And um, of course, we won't let you all go who are listening to take a moment yourselves to write down one takeaway for yourself. We're going to use the honor system. While you're doing that, I'd love to invite um, Anna, John and Dave to just give their 10 second one key piece of advice uh, to this audience here. Mine is just very simple. Um, get out of the box, be creative, innovate, and the, the good things are going to come your way. John? Um, I'm going to say you need to break out of, and I think at Jana's point, you need to break out of the box of thinking of work and jobs, of thinking of people as organization members, and of thinking as humans as an intact thing that is doing a job. Uh, a lot of the research that I'm doing with my colleagues has to do with deconstructing the work, deconstructing the individual, and permeating the organization boundaries. So I would say get ready for a new language of work where you will not have the luxury of thinking of it in terms of headcount in jobs and thinking of workers as people who exist with an employment contract. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Dave, over to you for the final comment. Uh, Amen, amen to both. I, I would emphasize and continue to emphasize learn. The best is yet ahead. I decided about two years ago that instead of doing more and more books, and we just had a book come out, I'm posting on LinkedIn every Tuesday a new article. It is hard to do. I've done about 80 of them. Um, every article is new, and it pushes ideas that are I don't understand. Um, I'm doing one tomorrow on uh, uh, the new organizational form of the future, the market-oriented market -oriented ecosystem. I'm doing one next week on HR professionals as caregivers. Learn. Get out of your comfort zone. Go explore what you don't know how to do. Fantastic. Just love to thank all of you, John Pedro, Dave Ulrich, Anna Tavis, everyone out there listening and hopefully getting energized. Thank you so much, and thank you to Enrique Rubio and Hacking HR for creating this opportunity for us to get together. Have a great Monday, everyone.